Hello friends, welcome to Dr. Sai Physiology Academy, DOPA for short. This is the place where we make learning of physiology easy, exciting and effective. Thank you for joining me. So today we are going to be dealing with concentration of urine. So what's so special about concentration? Why not dilution of urine? Okay, we talk about things because they have special significance. Because a dilute urine is the default. You know, the body expects that you should take in a lot of water, enough water. You know, in the very early part of this system, when we started talking in lecture one, we talked about the body water, body fluids, and all of that. That 60% of your body weight is water. So your body loves water and it, it, it expects you to always take water. So the urine, when you have a lot of water in your body, your urine will be dilute. So that's the default. How do I know it's the default also? Even the body has prepared itself structurally to attend to the changes from dilute to concentrated. Why? Remember that we said that you have two types of new nephrons. You have the cortical nephrons, number two, and the juxta medullary nephrons. Why is the body doing that? Why is it separating? Why are some? Because you know, the cortical ones, they are shorter. They end at that cortical side. Remember the structure, just picture it in your mouth of the, of the kidney. Their loop of Henle, which is the lowermost part, they end at that junction. It doesn't go deep inside the middle. But this juxtamedullary kind of nephrons, their loop of Henle, they are very long very long, go deep down, almost reaching the renal papilla. Just revisit the structure. So, these cortical nephrons, they're about 85%. This one, 15%. And you know what? It is this juxtamedullary nephrons that play role in concentrating urine. So only 15 because it is not the expected outcome. The expected outcome you are supposed to be taking on. But in some situations, maybe you find yourself in a place where the, there is no water, you lack water. Then of course, the body cannot keep excreting dilute urine. That's a lot of, that contains a lot of water. So it needs to now conserve urine till when you are exposed, you are, you have, in an environment where you have enough water to take in, then it goes back to the normal to use a lot of water to excrete waste. All right, so that's that's by way of introduction. So this is one of the things that's needed to concentrate urine, juxta. But there are other requirements. If urine needs to be concentrated, there are other requirements. Let's mention them. Number one, there needs to be the presence of ADH. In the lecture four, we mentioned ADH. We are going to now see how it plays a role in this concentration of urine. We'll talk about reabsorption at that late distal tubule and Collecting dots, ADH, plays role in the reabsorption of water. So for you to have concentrated urine, there needs to be ADH. Number two, there needs to be high medullary renal interstitial interstitial osmotic gradients 
high medullary renal interstitial osmotic gradient. Now, this is the interstitium, okay? This is just a simplified diet. This is not how nephrons actually look, but for the sake of this topic, just simplified it like this, okay? So, this is the tubule. So, this place, this is the interstitium. Now, not just any interstitium, medullary. Now, this place, this region here, the cortex, no, we divided it. Here is now outer medulla. Here is inner medulla. So, we are not talking about the interstitium around the cortical side. We are talking about the interstitium in the medulla, especially the inner medulla, because that's where you find the loop of Henle. Because the only difference between juxtamedullary and cortical nephron is the loop of Henle. This one is very long. Okay? So, number three is that you need juxtamedullary juxtamedullary nephrons for urine to be concentrated. You will see the reason very soon. And number four, you need what is known as vasa recta. Wow, what a funny name. Vasa recta, what's vasa recta? Vasa recta is the capillaries that surround this tubule of the juxtamedullary nephrons. Remember, what, what are they called in cortical nephrons? They are called peritubular capillaries. But when it comes to juxtamedullary nephrons, they have a special name. So let it not confuse you. They are capillaries that surround the tubule. Okay? But then they are not normal capillaries. Normal capillaries are just all around the tubule. But this vasa recta, they have a shape that is similar to the loop of Henle. In other words, they are like this. Let's use the red pen. They are also like this. You see it? Instead of being windy and bendy and all of that, it's very caused to align with the shape of the long loop of Henley. That's why it's called specially Vasa Recta. So these are the things, and all these things they are important. If anyone is missing, you can't have a concentrated urine. Okay? So why do you need a high interstitial osmotic gradient because all these ones they are easy to understand the one that is not so easy to understand is this how do you get a high osmotic gradient it's just talking about the fact that before what i realized because once you want to excrete concentrated urine it means that that urine has a small volume of water Water makes up 90 something percent of urine. So urine that has small volume means that that urine is concentrated because the solutes inside remain the same. What changes is the amount of water. So it means that at that, this co uh, um, collecting dots, water, a lot of water is reabsorbed based on the presence of ADH. So, but for water to be reabsorbed, it needs to align with osmotic gradient in the sense that this place, the interstitium, because water is entering from the tubule into the interstitium. So, and it's through osmotic, osmosis, osmotic gradient. So, this place needs to be highly concentrated so that water can, it will create a high, so that it favors the ease of movement of water. Because if the osmotic gradient is not high, water cannot easily move, even when you have ADH present. Okay? So ADH 
function is to stimulate the insertion of aquaporins. Aquaporins 2, type 2. So aquaporins, they are the water channels that water will pass through. But even when you have water channels, osmotic gradient needs to now draw the water. So that is what. So how this kidneys, the nephron, create a high medullary interstitial osmotic gradient is the major meat of this lecture. Okay? So we'll learn, we'll talk deeply into that after this break. All right, welcome back. So now what we want to delve into is how these kidneys create this high medullary interstitial, interstitial osmotic gradient. Okay? So, but one thing you should know is that this loop, why it is so long, is because it has a mechanism called a countercurrent mechanism, which means simply means that movement of substances in the descending part in one limb is opposite of the order in the ascending limb. That's why you have this curve here. So nothing is by chance. Why don't you just have a normal tube or everywhere normal? Why will you not have a part that is, you know, this loop of Henley, you have the hairpin bend that bends it and curves it to have two opposing sides. That is the real thing that happens there to create that counter current. And you see what, so let's write it down here. You have the counter current mechanism. Countercurrent mechanism is divided into two. You have the countercurrent multiplier and the countercurrent exchanger. Wow. What do we mean by all of this? So the countercurrent multiplier. What it does is that it's the one that creates this high osmotic gradient. Okay, then the countercurrent exchanger is done by the vasa rector. It does what it maintains. So one of them creates, one of them maintains. So we're going to see how it is multiplied. What do you mean by multiplier? Countercurrent multiplier. Now let's go into it. Okay, so the fluid, like we've said, that comes down from the proximal tubule into the loop of Henle is what they call isosmotic. You know, the normal osmolarity of the blood, osmolarity of the ECF is what, 300, milliosmos per liter okay so when fluid is filtered into the proximal tubule when it's entering the loop of henley it is still 300 why because equal amounts of water and solutes get reabsorbed in the proximal tubule so what is entering here is 300 but we need an osmotic gradient in this inner medullary interstitium to be as high as 1,200. <laughs> okay? At this place, it needs to be high. That's what we are talking about when we say high. So how do we create solutes that will be so concentrated at this place to we'll favor the absorption of water? So that's what we're going to be discussing. And let's clean this place. That multiplier mechanism has three major steps 
that you need to know. Just put it at the back of your mind when you are talking about the countercurrent multiplier mechanism. One of them is the pump step. Number two is what I call the equilibration step. And number three is the shift step. Now let's start with the pump step. Remember that in this loop of Henley, the thick ascending part of the loop of Henley around this part, what does it do? It pumps in solutes, sodium chloride. We talked about that in the previous lecture. So it's pumping solutes into this interstitium. But what happens is that it does not allow water to pass. So it keeps pumping solute here without water entering. That means here it's getting more concentrated, while here, inside here, it's getting more dilute. So that's we said as a diluting segment. But as it's diluting here, it's concentrating here. But that's not all. There is something that there's a little limitation. Now the fluid has come and gone here. We are just this is just for simplification, but we are assuming that the whole process is starting up from the beginning afresh. Okay, 300 milliosmo of, of filtrate is entering this place. And then it pumps solutes into this place. That means the osmolarity of this place will reduce. And it can only have a gradient between what is inside here and what is here of just 200. So 300 pump solute here, here will increase to 400. We are assuming that this place is, everything is equal, 300, 300 everywhere. But now it has pumped solute into this place. Here has increased to 400. Here has reduced to what? 200. So there is now a difference, a gradient of 200. So here is now 400. So what happens? Let's now see what happens here. So fresh filtrate flows down here. Still having 300. 300 is always coming. But then they will need, because of osmosis, remember that this place is permeable to water. Okay? This proximal place down to the descending, this is the descending loop of Henley. It's permeable to water. That means it allows osmosis to happen. So it will equilibrate with this 400. Okay? So water will be lost into this place so that this place can become 400 to match with this one. But you ask yourself, ah, ah, water is entering here. That means this 400 should now reduce, now should be dilute. But no. Why? Because this one keeps pumping, doesn't stop, it keeps pumping, so that even as water is entering here, it's adding more solutes, so that it will maintain this 400. Okay, so you now have, it now changes to 400. So 400 now moves down here, and comes to this place, and it keeps pumping, keeps pumping, it will now increase to 500 here, 300, as it's going up, it gets dilute, get, keeps getting dilute, okay. But here is now increasing to 500. 300 comes in here, equilibrates with this one, making here 500, and maintaining it 500, more is being pumped. So as it goes repeatedly over cycles of continuous pumping, pumping, equilibration, shift, that's flow of new fluid. Here becomes more and more concentrated till at this level, this helping bend level, this lowest level, it reaches up to 1,000 to 1,400 milliosmos per liter. It at this lowest point, okay, it has very concentrated. So that is 
what happens? High medullary interstitial osmotic gradient. So this is the counter current multiplier. Pump step, equilibration step, shift step, and you rinse and repeat like the colloquial way of saying it. It goes again and again till it becomes very hard. So we've talked about this multiplier. So how does this exchanger, how does it operate? Remember we said that its work is to maintain. Because remember these capillaries, during reabsorption, they collect substances from the interstitials into the capillaries and back to the bloodstream. So when you have created this high osmotic gradient here, if it's normal peritubular capillaries, that means it will just wash off all the solutes here. But we don't want that. That's why we have this special vasa recta that mimics, takes the shape of this loop of Henle. It's called. Now, everything about counter current is just to have two parallel limbs of something that have opposing effects to each other. You understand? So, whatever is happening in one limb is affecting whatever is happening in the other limb. If this thing was just straight, it will be impossible to create this, okay? So this one is diluting segment. This one is concentrating. So as it's coming down, getting concentrated, it's going up, getting dilute, okay? So understand that's counter current system. So now the vasa recta is like this. So it's very simple to understand. What happens here? As the solute is going down here, it's getting more concentrated. So the vasa recta, the same thing, it allows <clears throat> solutes to enter into it. It takes in solutes in this descending part and takes away water. So it's getting more concentrated. Allows solutes to enter into it and allows water to go out, to diffuse out into this interstitial part at this place. So just take note of these things. Sometimes it can be confusing. This descending part of the vasa recta, solutes enter into it progressively. So at this helping bend, it becomes very high, the highest point. And when you now go to the ascending part, solutes come out of the vasa recta. Because you no, know, as it's going up here, it's getting diluted. So the Vasa recta is mimicking it. So solid is going out of the vasa recta and water is going into the vasa recta. Alright? So as a result of that, these two opposing forces. Now when you have two opposing forces, there's now equilibrium balance. So that's how it happens to maintain the same thing. Opposing forces. Okay? In this limb, solutes are entering. In the other one, solutes are leaving. Water is leaving. Or this other than water is entering. And that's how it happens to maintain. If it's peritoneal capillaries, it will just wash out all this gradient here into the blood. And you will not have interst high interstitial medullary gradient that you need. All right? So we've done this and this. So what else do we need to talk about? There's one more thing. This whole high medullary interstitial something else plays a role in establishing it, in creating it, and that is urea. Yes. So it's not only sodium and chloride that creates this 1,200 to 1,400 milliosmos. Urea also plays a role. How does urea play a role? Listen very carefully. Very simple. Now, all of these segments down to the collecting dots, the distal tubule, early and late, they are what? Impermeable to urea. They are impermeable to urea and also they are impermeable to water. So what do you think will be the result? They are impermeable to urea, they are impermeable to water. So as it's going down, when ADH now starts acting on these collecting dots, 
water starts entering. So urea concentration now starts increasing and increasing when it gets to this inner medullary collecting dots. The concentration of urea becomes so high that it now is now forced to diffuse into this place. So normally, these places they are not permeable to both urea and water. But ADH, now, because when there is high, when you don't drink water, you are lacking water, your ECF concentration increases. So that's what stimulates ADH production. So ADH now takes in water, leaving urea behind. Urea will say no. No, urea sometimes it likes to follow water. You know, at that proximal part, we said solvent drag takes urea. So the same thing happens here. So when urea becomes more concentrated because ADH has taken water, the same ADH will now allow urea through urea transporters. Urea transporters are urea transporter A1, urea transporter A3. So these are the two urea transporters that are responsible for transporting urea from inside the tubo at this medullary col only, not the other part, this inner medullary collecting ducts into the interstice. So it now contributes to this, okay? So ADH plays a role in facilitating urea transport at this level, not at any other level, but at this inner medullary collecting ducts. So urea now adds to this high interstitial business. So sodium chloride and urea will contribute to this. Then the vasa recta, as we have mentioned, is what now maintains it. Okay? So that is what concentration of urine is all about. Remember that the initiating factor is high ECF osmolarity, which stimulates that some cells in the hypothalamus called paraventricular nucleus. So that's where ADH is secreted from. And then it now does its work. Allow water to enter, allow urea to enter, and all of this, okay? So you now excrete concentrated urine with small water so that more water is left in the body so that there will be balance, all right? So for further reading, I've written quite a few books in renal physiology and other areas of physiology. So check the description box, you see the link, a soft copy of the different books. Anyone you wish to get, just download it for a little token. And then you, know, you get a better grasp of these things. All right? So see you in the next video.